Welcome to this edition of Life, and welcome also to Barcelona, said to be one of the most successful cities in the 21st century, and certainly one of the most popular tourist destinations in Europe. Where better to discuss what makes cities work in the 21st century? Barcelona is a city by the sea. It's also an old industrial city that could all too easily have become a burnt out rust belt town left behind by the globalized world. What saved Barcelona was a progressive city council which planned for and invested in the future, renovating derelict neighborhoods and the old docks without destroying the city's old Catalonian charm. Barcelona is a city of three million people which could have had three million visions of the future but the city listened to people's hopes and fears and produced a single coherent vision, which so far has been a remarkable success. The man who has the job of turning that vision into reality is Jose Aceville, who's enlisted the help of world-renowned British architect Richard Rogers. Just explain to me a little about where we are now and how you've changed this area we're standing in. No, this area is very uh, typical to... to for the visualization of this question. For example, this is the architecture of Barcelona during the 19th century. This enormous building was designed and built in the Franco period. And during the last 10 years, the Port Authority and the municipality arrived to agreement in order to be public in this area that we are now. And this is the buildings for the facilities of the people designed in the last 10 years. And in the other side, in the Olympic Village, we, we, we have the possibility to relationship the city with the sea, because Barcelona has been always in the edge of the, of the sea, but the, for the citizens, it's not possible to arrive to the water practically till the 92 operation. Richard Rogers, what are your feeling looking at this landscape around us, which could have been an old, burnt-out, rust-belt uh, industrial waterfront, couldn't it? Well, I love Barcelona very much because of what it has done in the last 20 years. Barcelona is the urban uh, ideal for most planners and architects in, ter in terms that it's uh, the jewel in the, in the crown which we're trying to achieve in other, in other cities. Nothing's ever perfect, but they've got nearer to, the, to dealing with the, the industrial past, which is a very difficult period because we're seeing the end of heavy industry. This was a great port where we're staying, and they've changed it on one side, of course, with the new industries as well as move the port, but also with a quality of life, living, work, leisure, which is exceptional. And this sort of dream we see around is this slightly sort of television set ambience around here. That is something which is practical, which can be copied elsewhere. And, you, and as an architect, you, you believe that is possible? I'm quite sure. I mean, I think that you know, nearly every major city has, for instance, whether it's a river, whether it's a lake, uh, or whether the sea. That, and usually, it's one of the most beautiful places, and often it's the most wasted place, because it's where the industry used to be, and so on. So that's, a, that's a, a using an asset, you know, a God-given asset, and making it really tell in the everyday quality of life. Isn't there a problem in many cities that they're becoming increasingly divided, perhaps because of globalization? Some, a few people are doing fine, most aren't. Doesn't that make it more difficult to produce the kind of political consensus which you need to make something like this work? Globalization is good and bad because the, the good news is we can now start going to uh, one end of the, you can, go, you can go to Seattle or you can see it on television if you like, uh, you can go to San Francisco, you can go to uh, Curitiba and get those, those lessons and those activities. So you know you can do it and it isn't all about money, it's about, it's about vision. The bad side of it is when you get private investment who have no interest except for a quick buck. And therefore you have to mix the uh, knowledge, if you like, of business in making uh, money, but also recognize that business is not about, about uh, quality of life in long term. That's not their role. I mean, uh, but the citizens are about it, so they have to balance citizen, uh, the mayors, and, and business in, in a mixed economy. Common vision, not just chaos. Common vision. So, Barcelona, the dream city, not the case perhaps for quite everyone who lives here, but it is a decent working model, maybe, for the rest of the world. Now, here with me in the studios of Catalan Television to discuss the future of cities and towns in this urbanized and globalized century are Jose Acevillo, the architect in chief for Barcelona, who you've just met, Gary Lawrence, who had the thrilling but surely sometimes nightmarish job of actually being an urban planner. Gary was 
planning director for the city of Seattle on the Pacific coast of the USA. He now runs his own firm, Sustainable Strategies and Solutions, and he advises cities around the world. He was also part of the US delegation to the 1996 UN City Summit in Istanbul. Kalpana Sharma. Kalpana Sharma is deputy editor of the Hindu newspaper in India. She writes on environment and development and specializes in cities and the urban poor, which is the subject of her latest book, Rediscovering Dharavi. Michael Parks is here from the UN Center for Human Settlements, known as Habitat. That's the organization responsible for coordinating this week's five-year review of the UN City Summit in New York. Barcelona, the ideal city, it can't be that simple, can it? I've never been in any urban setting where there's uh, so many different lives trying to compete for the same space that there aren't some conflicts. Uh, I think uh, Barcelona has done a magnificent job in, in its urban design, the layout of the city, and by reputation, it's, it's a well-governed city. Kalpana, what are your first impressions of uh, being in Barcelona? Well, the thing I found most interesting was the fact that there is this old center of the city, which is a living center. I mean, so often I think you create tourist sites where people are expelled and, you know, it's made for tourists. And I talked to some of the people there. I even found Indians and Pakistanis uh, living there. But, of course, it's too short a visit to know whether there are also marginalized communities that are not incorporated into what we as visitors see. And that is a question that always arises with cities. Michael, is Barcelona a model city for the United Nations or are we pushing a point a bit? I think it's, no, I think it shows what you can do to make a city an attractive place to, to live in. You can upgrade, you, you can make the physical side attractive, but also the social side. I mean, what, what, what you've done is, in, is involve the people in, in the process of, uh, of, of making Barcelona such an excellent place. But just, just uh, going back to what you were just asking, you do see that on the threshold of Barcelona, coming from the airport, the new people coming in who are having to squat. So you do get a sort of image of a of part of, of a city in the south, in the developing world. So there are problems or opportunities that both the developing countries and the first world have in common. Now, that's one of the things that you and your colleagues are going to be concentrating on, are concentrating on this week at the UN Cities Meeting in New York. Can you explain what that is about and what you're trying to achieve? Uh, Habitat, the United, Cent United Nations Centre of Human Settlements, is concerned with those two things, with, with, with housing, with shelter. And, and with when shelter comes together to make towns. The reality is that half the world live in, in awful conditions. Uh, and there's perhaps over one billion people living with less than a dollar a day. So they haven't got access to loans, they haven't got houses, they haven't got security, and they probably haven't got access to water and services. Uh, so we're, we're attempting to raise the, pr the profile of that. The, the urban development side is, is to do with making the cities work, with getting the traffic to flow, access to schools and clinics. Now, obviously, this is a problem throughout the world. What can a small team of bureaucrats um, working for the United Nations possibly do? We've got to actually be positive and look that cities are actually can help the whole story of sustainable development. They're, they're actually but just to be clear, it's, it's rhetoric rather than firm action. Well, you have schemes, to move the rhetoric it? to action, don't you? You have to move to, to actually building houses and, uh, and, and roads and sewers, providing the services that people need. Uh, and you have to highlight the problems that, we, uh, that, that you're suggesting, that uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a big wave coming towards us. And if we don't discuss it, what, what, what's, the, what's the alternative? OK, well, now, what's, what's, let me come out to that in a minute. But what's different about this review of the City Summit in New York to the meeting in Istanbul five years ago is that we've now all begun to talk about that buzzword, globalisation. And we've been asking people in the cities we've travelled to for this series of life how they believe globalisation has affected the cities they live in. Globalization is uh, uh, um, influencing Calcutta, but I hope it's for the good. It was not yet time for it. We were not ready for globalization. It will help uh, people, you know, to increase their knowledge and to, you know, like open the possibility to get, uh, to get more jobs. It's one thing to sit here and be isolated and think you're it because the pond is so small. But now, if you say Jobek, somebody's going to compare it to New York, somebody's going to compare it to London. And if you live here, you're going to have to work with those standards too. So for me, it's competition, uh, and it's a good thing, and it's put us on the map. Gary, isn't this a problem for trying to plan cities in the 21st century, that globalization is creating winners and losers? They have less and less in common, and that makes it more and more difficult to have the kind of common vision that's made a city like Barcelona a success. Well. First of all, there have always been winners and losers. Um, I think globalization is, has exacerbated some trends. Um, 
uh, and has resulted on more attention, more movement into cities than existed before. Uh, you know, it's problematic uh, in part because most of the donor agencies and uh, are still interested in investing in the rural side of the equation. In a globalizing scheme, more people are going to the urban because it's, it's urban centers around the world that are competing with one another. It's not nations competing with one another. I think it is a very, very critical situation because for me, globalization is the possibility to lose the identity. Of losing your identity. Yeah. And then, hmm. for example, in Europe is very clear. Our historical centers in Torino, in, in, in Paris, in Barcelona, in Rome, are very small. The, the scale of the cities of Europe 1,000 years ago was very small. And then we restored and we recycled the historical centers. But when we finish with the architecture of the stone, with the physical architecture, arrive the McDonaldization, for example, and arrive the Benetton, uh, Coca-Cola, uh, Pans and Company. The, and brands the, take, and, the brands and, take over. And the landscape is not the medieval landscape, it's the new landscape. And we can talk about of many, many questions about it. And then I, in, in the case of Barcelona, I personally I was very worried for the possibility to lose in the identity. Do you have to worry about this in India, or are you grateful when McDonald's and Starbucks move in? Well, Starbucks hasn't, McDonald's has, and I don't think it's You'll, you'll get there in the end. I mean, do, do, is, is this a problem for you? Well, you? in one sense, it should not be, because the country is large, it can absorb all this and still survive. I think the trouble is that our cities in India were industrial centers, you know, and manufacturing centers. And now, suddenly, they're going through this process of becoming service-oriented, uh, like cities like Bombay or Calcutta and so on. And nobody's asking what's happening to the people who are working in these factories which have closed down. And they're the ones who are being pushed to the margin, you know. And you're, you're uh, creating an unstable city. Now, in the globalized world, it's not just money that moves around fast, but people. Migrants flood into urban areas, creating problems of homelessness and overcrowding in cities around the world. With the overcrowding, uh, there's also crime involved in that. So there's. You know, I'll put it this way, that you find people are, most of the time, people are living in fear. The big problem here is uh, the very uh, poor uh, people, the poor uh, people that live in, in, in the street. I think there are a lot of, lot of extremely poor people, um, homeless people, especially young people, lots of kids living on the streets. Every day, every day, I arrived a lot of people in Sao Paulo, another city, try to a new life, uh, get a money. It's difficult, difficult. Kalpana, if people flock into the cities from the countryside and don't have homes and end up living on their streets, um, is it their own fault? I don't think so. I mean, I think anybody who would come into a place to look for work, if there's no option for housing, then you squat on vacant land or on a pavement or whatever, even along railway tracks as we've had in Bombay. And why should anybody else help you sort that out? Why should you look to the state for assistance? Well, I think it is incumbent on the state to accept the fact that cities are made out of people who have a lot and people who don't have anything, but all contribute to the economy of the city. And I think, therefore, that is the role of the state, to facilitate the kind of housing which would be affordable to people who are at the bottom of the rung. And I think the trouble has been in our cities, particularly, that there has been no planning for public housing. Uh, and this dates back to before independence. Do you believe, Michael, that housing should be a human right? It's part of the, of the, of the whole human rights uh, st uh, story that you, you need shelter, you need a roof. How can you operate? How can you have dignity? How can you bring up a family? How can you, uh, a house is a, is a, is a hospital and a, and a school. How can you go to work? If you haven't got somewhere, if you haven't got some somewhere to some space in the world to live, also there are forced displacements. You know that's the other thing that I think we've not discussed. Mm -hmm. And the point is, people are coming in because of infrastructure projects that are inevitably built, you know, in the rural areas like dams and or uh, things, and people are being forced <coughs> to come because they're just given no option. D do you accept this that housing should be a human no. right? I would like to say that if for many people, the city is only the buildings from the physical point of view. And the city is the balance between the buildings and the space in between. And for example, in the case of Barcelona, if you ask me what is the first point, is the quality of the open space. And this is very, very important for the people. If you go to Barcelona this afternoon, 
and visit the Ramblas, you will be in the core of the city, and this is the most important place, the most interesting place, the most fashionable place, and for all people. In the U.S., one of the questions we always ask now is, whose place is this? Uh, I mean, and that's the importance of the public space. In Barcelona, with the squares, it's clear that this place belongs to the people. Public housing was never owned by the people mentally, let alone financially, by the people who lived there because they were isolates, and it was always the government's place where they were put. You were talking about globalization a few minutes ago. I think the other, th the other phenomenon is localization. Is in fact, the importance of uh, working together at the local level both with all, with, all, with the total uh, panorama of uh, society. Okay. So you need to bring, you need to work with the private sector, with, with the people themselves, who are actually very good at uh, delivering what let, they need. Let me move on, Michael, because I yeah. you wanted to yeah. raise the question of, of, of gender. Um, one theme of this week's conference is gender as women as the relative role of men and women in cities in the developed and developing world. Cities, after all, are built for men, by men, usually, but they are not built for women, and surprisingly, they don't often work for women either, as we found. I think women have a bigger opportunity to improve their lives than they did before, but I, I don't think that they have an equal opportunity yet. The segregation isn't as bad as in other countries where there's still that African myth that a woman is a subordinate, you know? So yeah, the, they give you the opportunity as so long as you assert yourself and you work hard at it, you do get companies that upgrade you, but they, all at the same time, there's still that thing that a woman is a woman. Wherever I might be in Calcutta, I should be safe enough and my parents should be uh, well prepared for the fact that I am safe enough wherever I am in Calcutta. Now, for a lot of women in the world, it's true, isn't it, that cities are very dangerous places? Well, if you look at the, the, the figures for developing country cities, you'll find that uh, probably 40 to 50 percent of the households are female-headed, partly because of the migration that we talked about, partly because the, the, the men have, uh, have, have left. So you have to have to deal with, with the, that fact. And then you, it, it's bad, not because of, um, it's bad because of things like sanitation. You know, the, 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 there was a meeting recently and the a woman eventually said, all I need is a toilet. You know, something simple like that. Do you yeah. find that women are, if, they were in a, if women are running households in the developing countries, does that mean they're really the bosses rather than the victims? Well, I think it depends a lot. I mean, I think in India, for instance, in the cities, actually, it's an adverse sex ratio. There are fewer women and there are more men. So I don't think that has quite happened of migration of women on their own. But there are women-headed households. And women are forced to be strong, you know, because they have to fight all the time, especially women living in cities. I mean, I've interviewed a lot of them on a variety of subjects. And they say, we spend our whole lives fighting. You know, I've talked to them about violence. And they say, you know, what is this abstract thing you're talking about? Every single day, I have to fight for my five buckets of water. But I'll say one thing, that it, when we were talking earlier about housing, I mean, there's no consultation in terms of including women in the design of houses. You know, even, the reason why public housing is such a failure is not only that the people for whom the housing is planned are not consulted, but the women are not consulted. Gary, you travel the world trying to help people run cities and build cities. How many of the people who come to listen to you are men and how many are women? It depends very much on the, the audience. Uh, let me get, give you an industrialized world example. Uh, because, I mean, it's not just that uh, women are, uh, have to expend so much more energy to live their lives than men do in any sort of city context. It's also that uh, without women's voices, you can't actually incorporate issues for children. Uh, you know, uh, we were doing a comprehensive plan for the city of Seattle, and, uh, you know, here I am, large white male roaming through life, you know, unconscious about these sort of things. We had advisory groups from uh, women's organizations throughout the city, and we learned that the city looks entirely differently from the eyes of a child than the eyes of an adult. So we had planners in little carts being pulled around the neighborhood so they could actually see the sight lines that children see and found out how they were just living in a, in a world of blank walls. You mean that, you, oh, sorry, you mean that literally? You literally, yeah. D yeah. Just out of interest, do you listen to this and think this is the kind of thing that only a, d a rich, developed country would ever imagine doing? Uh, naturally. I mean, it's so wonderful to hear it. But uh, I was just thinking that when you were talking in, in the case of uh, Bombay, for instance, when the consultation about toilets took place, it's because women were included in discussing it that they came up with the idea of having children's toilets, you know, because the Indian-style toilet is such that a child cannot use it. So even though the municipal corporation was building toilets, children were squatting outside those toilets because mothers didn't want them to use those toilets because they'd fall in. 
you know, and so I take Gary's point that, you know, I think if women are consulted, then children's needs are taken care of. But there's a huge difference between the kind of needs that you're oh, yeah. talking about and the kind yeah. of needs, so, you know, the very basic needs so, that we have to. Okay, well, let's talk about how cities are run. Housing, gender, crime, disorder. The fundamental problem, of course, is that cities around the world are too often badly run, although we found some people who do approve of how their cities are governed. There's a lot being done to sort out the crimes. There's a lot being done to to try and sort out the, the economic disparities, if you like. Uh, just like the entire country, I think the whole world is aware that a lot has been done to fix things here. Yeah. Looking at the streets of Johannesburg and looking at the standard of living in Johannesburg and the rate of unemployment in Johannesburg, I don't think that it's been well governed. Right now in India, everybody is looking after their position, political position. Nobody is thinking about country or state or city, nobody bothers us, they say it. Carpenter, it's become fashionable to say that a lot of the problems of the developing world are brought about by bad governance. Is that true in cities? Are most of them just simply badly run? Well, I think it's sort of governance by default. That's the way I see it. You know, I think it's, it's like all our governments, uh, city governments, are walking up a down escalator. They're not, they're just about coping. There's nobody who's thinking in terms of a vision for the city you know, anticipating what the city would be. Is it Richard, right, Michael, to be asking the rest of the world, as Western governments effectively do, or asking their voters um, to help cities and developing nations when a lot of the money will disappear in corruption? Uh, the, whole, we, the whole, the whole about point that? about encouraging governance is to address the problems of tilting against corruption, uh, having regulations that are appropriate, ha having, a, having a local authority which, which is answerable to the people. I mean, the definition in my terms of governance is decision making, is getting people to be involved in what, what, what they want. But you can't just have that, you also need management, you also need to follow it through of how to do it. So you need a combination of, of good governance and, and good urban management to, to help address the problems that we're, we're talking about. Jose, I'm sure you don't have problems of corruption or in Barcelona, maybe there's still some inefficiency. <laughs> I hope, <laughs> I hope so. But I, I, I don't understand why we talk about of the corruption in a relationship with the cities. That's where the money is. Because I think, no, because the money is not in the cities, in the central governments. Well, that's where the and cities the are. No, 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 the main, no. I, excuse me, and I think that the main problem of our civilization is that the, in the last century, the governments, the central governments, has forgot of the problem of the city. In the 60th century, in Florence, the main important problem of the Prince of Medici was the city of Florence. And today, the most important problems of the presidents of the United States are not the cities. And the cities is only for the mayor, the most difficult and complex job, job of the world. And I, always, I know very well, the, because I work in the city of Barcelona from the in the last 20 years. Is this this notion that we're moving into an age of almost literally of city-states and the nation-state is dying out, cities are the future and will end up governing themselves, is that true? The economy has decided that exchanges take place between city-states, not between nations. Um, and the whole globalization phenomenon has been a shift from national agendas to the agendas of economic regions, uh, sometimes within the same country, sometimes the central cities. Uh, and it's created a, a tension we haven't talked about, and that is charismatic mayors, people who govern well, people who can inspire people to greatness are always perceived to be the political rivals of the national government. So there's this element of politics that also exists here that's uh, difficult to overcome. Is that, do you believe that uh, the cities are going to take over no, and the nation state? I, I don't think so. I mean, I don't think there's any possibility of that. And I think w what I see in the future is a sort of a two-class uh, system in terms of cities, where you'll have global cities, even within a country like India, no matter where, where the economy goes, uh, which will get all the benefits of being part of this global economy and all the problems that come with it. And you'll get the other smaller cities which will continue to struggle without getting the funding and without getting any of the attention that they ought to get. So do, do you believe, Michael, that cities are the future? I mean, is Habitat they, they, going to be the, the executive of some 21st century world government? It, cities are here to stay. If half the cities are in a bad state, it makes the other half of the city bad. So there's problems, as you said, of security and so on. So we have, we have to uh, tend to all these problems. It, it's the, it is the urban century we're moving into. First time in the history of mankind. And, and uh, all these things have to be done. 
Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you, Gary Lawrence, Jose Acevedo, Kalpana Sharma, and Michael Parks. And good night from Barcelona, a city where you can see what can be done when people agree how to build the cities of the future. We started with empires, mostly in the 19th century. We came to the nation states of the 20th century. And believe me, through globalization now, we are entering this is a center of cities.